Neo Tokyo 2019. Civil unrest plagues the city, and political factions seek to usurp power. Human life is slowly degrading despite technological advances, and social structures are slowly eroding, which is evident in the daily life of the youth as they are street gangs and through the bad schooling they have. A gang member is injured by an escapee child with psychic abilities who is a part of a government project. Soon, he becomes a tool to harness the powers of an almighty being known simply as Akira. You've never seen anything quite like Akira. Released in 1988, Akira is regarded as one of, if not the greatest animated movie of all time. The film single-handedly opened the door to Japanese animation in the West, making anime the international sensation it is today, and paved the way for films like Ghost in the Shell and Metropolis. Rarely I ever see Akira talked about in length, apart from hardcore anime circles, but yet, over 30 years later, the film remains ever so relevant and has rightfully earned its spot as an essential anime classic, a fantastical and hypnotic flight of imagination serving both as a two-hour journey of escapism and as a portal into the then-booming world of anime-based storytelling. And come to think of it, Akira came out in quite an exciting time in Japan's history, the 1980s, for the first time since World War II, Japan was beginning to see a major economic upturn, bringing the Tokyo Stock Index to an all-time high and surging Japan's economy to unseen heights. Japan in the 1980s was home to the single largest economic bubble in world history that created a fabulous, almost unbelievable amount of wealth in this small island country. This meant that the average Japanese family could live a comfortable middle-class lifestyle. This excess of disposable income meant that there was a massive influx of money to both consume and create film, music, and of course, animation. This was more than a fiscal boom, however, since anime had already been a commodified industry for over a couple decades. Anime of this era was raw, energetic, emotional, exciting, and experimental. Harrowing and thoughtful depictions of the chaos brought on by war like Grave of the Fireflies, explosive and brutal action series like Fist of the North Star, grim and surreal views of the future like Neo Tokyo and Wicked City, joyous flights of imagination like Castle in the Sky, and exciting and insanely polished OVAs and series like Dirty Pair, Megazone 2-3, and Gunbuster. Unlike a lot of people in the US who only view animation as a genre for children and nothing more, the Japanese felt that animation shouldn't just cater to any one audience, that it could depict just about anything, and this was them slamming up the boundaries against those common preconceptions. And so the 80s was awash with anime that was avant-garde, adult, and beautiful. And the precipice of this came in the form of Akira. Akira was first introduced in 1982 in an issue of Young Magazine by Katsuhiro Tomo, who was fresh off the manga Fireball, an unfinished series in which he disregarded accepted manga art styles and which established his interest in science fiction as a setting. Fireball anticipated a number of plot elements of Akira, with its story of young freedom fighters trying to rescue one of the group's older brother who was being used by the government in psychic experiments with the older brother eventually unleashing a destructive fireball of energy. Before Akira was first published in 82, teenagers and young adults felt underrepresented in the manga they read, so Young Magazine was looking to plug this gap. The Akira manga is very different from the movie in many ways. Rather than focusing on just one protagonist, the manga focuses on several. For example, Lady Miyako, the religious zealot prophesizing about Akira's return, played a much bigger role in the manga. She was the leader of a temple that trained psychic disciples to defeat Akira. She channeled the last of her energy, 
to one of her disciples to defeat him. Now, the manga doesn't really concern itself with Kaneda much. He's even absent from one of the books. He was a bit of a comic relief meant to relieve tension. On paper, he would hardly be main character material, but that's the kind of logic Otomo bucked when he adapted the manga to screen. で、now, Tetsuo's girlfriend Kaori is a sex slave in the manga. He, she appears at a time when Tetsuo's power was starting to crush his psyche, making him more and more unstable. This is why the development of a bizarrely sincere relationship had so much impact. Even after Kaori died, Tetsuo still held on to her memory and attempted to resurrect her. In the film, however, she starts off as being Tetsuo's girlfriend. Their relationship in both versions is doomed, and in both versions, they are equally powerful. The manga for its intrigue, and the movie for its impact. Kaori served the plot in the manner each incarnation called for. This manner just varied between the two. There were several characters in the manga that weren't in the movie that played a big role in the story each with their own strengths, weaknesses, and motivations that play a part in shaping a much larger narrative. So in a technical sense, Akira isn't really what you'd call a full adaptation of the manga, since it was created before the production of, and during and after the release of the movie, with the manga finally concluding in June 1990. With the production of the movie, a lot of plot elements had to be cut out in order to fit a two-hour runtime removing pages upon pages worth of plot. Both versions of Akira are, in fact, the original versions of the story, with the Tomo stating that the experience of directing the movie shaped the direction of where the rest of the manga was headed. Akira tells the tale of a post-apocalyptic world that hovers on the brink of World War IV. The movie starts out in July 1988, where a nuclear bomb strikes Tokyo. World War III commences quickly thereafter. 31 years later, in a Neo-Tokyo plagued by civil unrest, a young biker gang called the Capsules, led by Kaneda Shotaro, is waging a cycle war with the rival clown gang. Tetsuo Shima, one of the Capsules, is severely injured by a psychic child who is part of a government project. Tetsuo is taken along with the child to a military facility where he is tested. Tetsuo becomes a tool for the government to harness the power of Akira, a young boy who has been dissected and kept in cryonic suspension since World War III, which he started. What follows is an intense rush by Kaneda to prevent Tetsuo from being consumed by the great power he has been given. Now, in a lot of American and Japanese sci-fi, there's this reverence for technology. Unlike American sci-fi, which treats technology as a way to prevent some major catastrophe, Japanese sci-fi has a rather cynical approach to it, as it's not so much about preventing disaster, but rather learning to survive once disaster has struck. In the American occupation that followed Japan's surrender, all negative discussion of the bombings of Nagasaki was forbidden. Instead, criticism of the attacks surfaced in other cultural outlets, primarily in Japanese art, literature, and cinema. Most notably, the Godzilla films, many of which are steeped in skepticism towards science, criticism of the military, and distrust of the government. The exact same motifs found in Akira. The story of Akira is an allegory for post-World War II Japan. The events that take place in the movie mirror the real-life events that actually happened in Japan in real life. The movie begins when a bright white light suddenly fills the screen as an enormous explosion, illustrated by a semi-transparent black dome, engulfs the city of Tokyo and leaves only a black crater in its wake. The opening scene mirrors the real-life bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, which took the lives of over hundreds of thousands of people over the ensuing years. In the years leading up to World War II, the totalitarian Showa regime, 
was faced with growing militarism. The military's move to control the nation's politics directly resulted in the numerous incidences of violence, including many assassinations. Control was seized from political parties and distributed amongst admirals and military leaders, including a period of hypernationalism. This political climate paved the way for Japan's involvement in the war. In the aftermath of the bombings, hundreds of Japanese orphans were relocated to China, essentially abandoned by the Japanese government. The concept of a lost generation is apparent in the hidden world of the child espers Takashi, Kyoko, and Masaru, a childhood grotesquely destroyed by the experimentation of the government. The child espers are prematurely aged in appearance, forced to grow up much faster than their peers due to the politics of a self-interested and reprehensible government. The atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima was nicknamed Little Boy, a parallel to the Akira character, a mute little boy and eventual harbinger for the destruction of Neo-Tokyo. Military failures and government corruption are rife in Akira. The labor strikes and student protests mirror the reaction to the real-life U.S.-Japan Security Treaty in 1960. The treaty committed the United States to help defend Japan if Japan came under attack and it provided bases and ports for the U.S. armed forces in Japan. When the treaty was placed into effect, student groups and labor unions took to the streets to protest out of fear of more Japanese militarism and imperialism and the fear that this could cause even more hostility against Japan and East Asia. Before the rise of Tetsuo, Neo-Tokyo is already a totalitarian state. Protesters are violently suppressed by the militaristic police force in the first act. The passion to build is cooled, and the joy of reconstruction forgotten. Now, now it's just a garbage heap made up of a bunch of hedonistic fools. But in spite of that, you're trying to save the city. I'm not a scientist. I think like a soldier. This ineptitude of Colonel Shikishima's military aggravates the tumultuous situation during Tetsuo's rise to power, with the military group ultimately handling control of the capital to Tetsuo's gang of religious zealots. The concept, rather than the character of Akira, represents the atom bomb itself. Kei explains in a conversation with Kaneda that like atoms, Akira is present in all things. In this scene, Kei makes direct references to nuclear war arguing that while amoebas contain the power of Akira... Amoebas don't build their own houses and bridges, do they? They just devour all the food they can find around them. Is that what Tetsuo's doing? Are you saying he has that kind of energy? In addition to being a film about post-World War II sensibilities, Akira is also a film about self-destruction and the nihilism that comes with it. In the police station scene, we see a protester attempt to nuke a massive, suspect-packed police station in the aftermath of the protests that took place earlier in the film. The main characters of Akira, Tetsuo and Kaneda, are actually quite nihilistic themselves. While in a way they're mostly empty lives with violent clashes with rival biker gangs, they survive by a sparkling, but familiarly lopsided camaraderie. As kids, they were both orphaned, raised without parents and without wisdom. The James Dean factor means that they enjoy a great deal of popularity and attention from women, but there is clearly a void for both of them. The differences that separate the two, however, define proceedings and in many ways act as a cataclyst. In the classic Alpha Gamma dichotomy, Kaneda is clearly the dominant male and in many ways isn't just the big brother, but the boss. His easygoing casualness and self-assurance, clearly a well-adapted tool of coping as revealed by flashbacks, means that not only does he dominate the group, but also himself. It doesn't give him the time to think back or even truly think at all, creating an imbalance in his friendship with Tetsuo, who is under his thumb. You've been telling me what to do since we were kids. You always treat me like a kid. You always show up and start bossing me around, and don't you deny it! Clearly more prone to his emotions, Tetsuo naturally falls foul of the plot, and in turn, his rage. Tetsuo's angst can be seen immediately from his first appearance. While Kaneda is left to his own devices, alone listening to a jukebox before being summoned by Yamagata, Tetsuo is seen looking in awe at Kaneda's bike. The bike represents Tetsuo's envy and resentment towards Kaneda. It's also important to note how Kaneda and Tetsuo respectively act towards women. Despite being on the run after shooting an officer in the face, Kaneda is more fixated on trying to woo Kei not even giving up the ghost when he is accosted by her colleagues. 
A similar scenario involving Tetsuo and Kaori works out far differently. Although Tetsuo seeks her out, he is focused on his own situation and behaves dismissively towards her, even when attempts to reach out are made. While Kaneda has clearly worked hard to release his past and his hurt sufficiently to live what could be considered a normal life, one where he chooses to prioritize the potential in his future, Tetsuo simply cannot overcome his grief, and as such, misses out on the glaringly ironic fact that someone he cares about is willing to accept him even as he rages about not being accepted. Shut up! Don't order me around! You were just worried. Why do you always have to try to save me? When he breaks down, both physically and emotionally, soon after Kaori and Kaneda bear the brunt of his all-engulfing emotional state, the anger we saw stewing from Tetsuo finally pours out as he loses his mind. This is probably the most revelatory side effect of his pervasive, self-destructive psyche. Since he has been abandoned and left in the shadows of a cruel world, he chooses to perceive everyone around him in the negative, even when they are not. As I've already mentioned, Kaneda's bike represents Tetsuo's envy and resentment towards him. Everything that Tetsuo's festering anger has made him loathe about his friend. The bike is Kaneda being better, tougher, and more imposing than he is. His fury at constantly being ordered around, treated like a child, leads him to believe that Kaneda is only his friend because Tetsuo knows he can play top dog without fear of reprisal. As a matter of fact, Kaneda asserts himself onto Tetsuo because he knows he has to. It's not just a dynamic that comes naturally and works well, it's a deliberate effort to ensure Tetsuo's safety. It's not done out of exploitation and self-aggrandizement, but out of deep-lying care and necessity, since Tetsuo is incapable of taking care of himself alone, as it will see him fall into a cycle of masochistic self-punishment and ultimately, self-destruction. Tetsuo can't see this because he's too centered on his own rage. Tetsuo's metamorphosis, coupled with this unrelenting psychic destruction, represents a form of all-out adolescent resistance to an increasingly meaningless world in which the oppressive authority figures administer the rules simply to continue in power. Contrastingly, the father and authority figure of Colonel Shikishima begins the story being in total control, slowly losing it as Tetsuo's power grows, culminating in violent scenes of destruction. In many ways, Akira positions itself as a film that celebrates the apocalypse. To put it in simpler terms, it doesn't view war or the apocalypse as an evil that should be avoided, but rather an unavoidable mechanism for change. In Susan J. Napier's book, Anime, From Akira to Princess Mononoke, she notes that this celebratory mode of the apocalyptic narrative is shown throughout the film's postmodern aspects. A rapid narrative pace enforced by the soundtrack, its fascination with fluctuating identity, as evidenced in Tetsuo's metamorphoses, its use of pastiche both in revelation to Japanese history and cinematic styles, and its ambivalent attitude towards history. This historical ambivalence runs counter to other works within this apocalyptic mode, such as Princess Mononoke, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, and Fist of the North Star. The use of pastiche in Akira is embodied both in its negative treatment of parents, who are seen abandoning their children, and in the film's climax, which takes place at the rebuilt Olympic Stadium, the site of the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, and a symbol of Japan's re-emergence to the world stage after the devastation of World War II, and showcase Japan as a future world power. When the stadium is ultimately destroyed in the course of the fight, accompanied by yet another vignette of old Tokyo's black crater, Akira literally decomposes constructs Japan's past by blowing it away. This deconstruction culminates in the final scene of the film, when Tetsuo is transported to what the audience can assume is another dimension. The film ends with Tetsuo's disembodied voice declaring, I am Tetsuo. Which illustrates Tetsuo's transition from childhood to adult, marking his entry into the symbolic order. But someday, we ought to be able to... Because it has already begun. <laughs>